This Parsha is the only Parsha in all the Parshas that deal with Moshe from the time of his birth to his death in which his name does not appear. The Midrashim states that Moses' name does not appear in this text primarily for one reason, and that was the sin of the golden calf when he negotiated with the creator of the universe and said that if you're going to destroy your people today, blot my name out of the book of life. And so uh, it says that the, the, the covenant of a tzaddik, when he makes a declaration, that even if the, on which, that, that which the declaration is attached to is nullified, that declaration still stands because he's a tzaddik. He stands for his word. Very powerful idea. Not only that, but we see that Aaron, who is now being highlighted as the high Kohen Gadol, we know, according to the sages, that Moshe was supposed to be the high Kohen Gadol. And he, um, he advocated uh, or negated his role when he basically argued with the Creator at the burning bush, saying that he was not capable of being a leader. He wasn't capable of speaking out. And so he brought Aaron by his side, and therefore Aaron uh, stepped into the role as one who could speak for the people on his behalf. Now think about this. Moses continues to speak to the people, uh, to God, to the people on the behalf of the creator of the universe, but Aaron was given the responsibility of speaking to uh, the people and speaking to God on behalf of the people and God. It's an incredible concept, so um, it, it makes you uh, think. The text this week is going to deal with three major areas. One is going to be the oil that will be made for the menorah. The next is the priestly garments. We're going to discover that the priestly garments, uh, uh, what the difference between the Haiko and Gadol's garment and the priest itself. And if I could get, uh, could, if you grab this book on the far end and just open it up to where you're looking at the garments and I might have you uh, display that in a minute. Um, it starts off by saying in, in, in Shemot, which is Exodus 27, verse 20, it says, You should command the Israelites that they take pure olive oil beaten from, uh, for the light to the, uh, to the lamps continually. A very interesting word or con concept. It says, for the light to be lit continually. It's a light that is not to go out. And it says, Aaron and his sons should set it up in the tent of meeting outside of the curtain, which is before the testimony, to burn from evening until evening before the Lord. The Lord is a statute forever for the Israelites throughout their generations. So the oil. Let's talk about the oil for just a moment. The oil here is not to be crushed. Why could it not be crushed? Why could the, in the traditional method of making olive oil, why could it not be crushed? Does anybody know? Precisely. So what they would do is they, did, they couldn't have impurities and it had to be pure. So this was like extra virgin, three times over, triple A, pure olive oil, right? It like, had no impurities in it at all. Now, in today's process, they cold press olive oil and then they run it through a series of filters to make sure that it's very pristine. They didn't run it through filters at this time. Obviously, didn't have the technology to do it. So what they would do is take the ripest olives that were at the top of the tree, and they'd wait till they really get ripe. I mean, they're almost starting to get overripe. And they take them and collect them in a, like a hemp uh, sack or like a, you know, a tweed bag, and then they would put it, and then they would put a heavy object on it and just weigh it down. And it would sort of pop the fruit, but not the, um, it wouldn't crush the seed and all that stuff. And so what would come out of that would be very pure olive oil, be barely gently pressed, and the oil would come out. And so the idea, according to the Midrash, is that the, B'nai, uh, that the house of Israel constantly would be occupying themselves with a mitzvah. And that, Hashem said, so that they should gain merit. He told Moses, at this time, his name is not even mentioned. He says, you. How impersonal is that? But he says, you are responsible to make sure the oil is collected. So it is Moshe's responsibility to make sure that the people gather this oil. Now, though the instructions were quite clear on how the oil was to be produced and made so that it was at its purest, they didn't have olive trees in the wilderness. So the oil that had to come 
had to come from people's stock of pure oil that they would bring in. Olive oil at the time uh, was processed in a couple of different ways. One, they would do the first press. And the first press was sort of a cold press, olive oil that would be very pure, that could be used in lamps, and in this case, used in the menorah. And then there was, after they do the first press, they do the second press by putting it in a, under a millstone, right? And it would be turned and crushed, or it would be put in a, what do they call a basin? Help me here. Petal, uh, what do they call it? Yeah, more than pestle, right? And it would be smashed up, and then it would be pressed. All of the, the bulk would be pressed, and you would get more oil. But the problem is, is that oil had a lot of, uh, and when we say impurities, it wasn't bad. It was just the fact that it had all of the fruit in it, like you would do with any other fruit that you grind up. That oil was used for breads, for mixes, for salads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That oil obtained from the second press could also be used in the... Um, and the meal offerings that were given and other offerings uh, within the temple, but what could not be used in the lamp. The idea here is that Moses was personally entrusted to be the trustee to receive the con contributions of olive oil. The olive oil, or the process of producing olive oil, it's, that process is the mitzvah. I want you to help me think about this, this for a second. The process of making the olive oil is the mitzvah. The, the lighting of the olive oil is the result or the byproduct of your mitzvah. You follow? So you have to work on the olive oil, and the olive oil, that process, then it becomes light and illumination. Let me ask, does God need light? Why does the, the creator of the universe, which is light himself, need light? He doesn't need light. So what was the light for? Was the light because God was lonely in the Mishkan in the dark? No, it wasn't lonely at all in the Mishkan in the dark. The light was for the people. It was also for the nations. It was for everyone to be illuminated. That is, so they could plainly, if you could think about this, without the light of menorah, that you couldn't see the hand in front of your face in the Mishkan. It was pitch black. There were three levels of curtains, three or four, three levels of curtains over the top of the Mishkan. I mean, you could not see anything inside of that. So therefore, the only light in the, the Mishkan was the light of the menorah. So the idea is that as long as the people were doing their job, the priest would be able to have illumination to do their job, right? There's a saying in the, uh, in, in the, uh, the Midrashic text, that there was a time during Israel's history that their, uh, their olive production went, was down. And they were concerned that they were going to have enough pure olive oil for the menorahs for the next coming year. And obviously they went into that next year and it was pretty bad. They were also having to ration it with the land. And those spiritual leaders and the priests were concerned that maybe this is reflective of the fact that maybe mitzvahs are, have been missed, that the people are losing their connection with Hashem. And the miracle took place was though they had a low level of oil, they were able to sustain the menorahs being lit all the time with no problems at any time during the year. They always had, the oil seemed to sustain and last itself longer. It's, an, it's a beautiful story. So, only oil uh, that is brought here Let's see, did I mention about the, the mitzvahs? Okay, yeah, I want to say this. We have two types of oil that can be used. One is inferior in the sense that it is not at its highest level of purity, correct? If you'll notice by reading the 613 commandments, uh, you have no possible way of knowing which, which mitzvah has the highest reward and which is the lowest reward. Hashem doesn't tell us, does He? Don't you wish He would? If you give this, this gives you a, a 90% reward. If you do this, it's only a 10% reward. That would be really nice. But the problem is most of us would focus only on the 90 and we'd forget the 10. However, we do know there's some mitzvahs that require uh, there is a severe punishment if it's not done. So therefore, we must understand that maybe that mitzvah is at the highest level. What are those two mitzvahs? Shabbos and idolatry. If you do any, if you miss Shabbos or you or worship idols, psh, you're cut off from the people. 
That's a very stringent thing to say to somebody, which means to do those things must have the highest value. I can make that assumption, but I honestly don't know. But one thing for sure, if, if the oil represents the product of our mitzvah and the light represents the result of our mitzvah, then that means that the mitzvahs that we do must bring illumination to the world. Must, period. There are some mitzvahs that some people don't know about. Have no idea? They wouldn't know that you do those mitzvahs. Who knows that you're doing a mitzvah of washing your hands and, and, and uh, saying prayers in the morning? Except for the fact that illumination comes into the world, no one knows that you're doing it. And no one knew the individual Israelite who brought the oil for that day. No one had a clue. All they knew was the byproduct was the light. Why did Hashem select olive oil in this process? The prophet Jeremiah says in Jeremiah uh, 11, 15, he says, a fresh olive, a fruit beautiful shape, did Hashem call your name Israel. So in which way the, the people of God, and I would also say the righteous among the nation, how are they like olives? Just if olive oil is one of the finest of all oils in the world, as a matter of fact, it's very expensive. What do we pay? Six dollars for even a decent bottle of olive oil that's the off-brand, right? Now, if you go to buy a very special olive oil, you can pay $13 for the same kind of bottle or maybe even $20. Why is that the case? It's because all of Israel and the righteous in the nation are the holiest of all the people of the nations. They carry a very special place. The olive yields its precious liquids only after being, and this is a powerful idea, processed, pressed. Similarly, the result of having been banished from one place to the next by Gentiles having been beaten, tied, tortured, all the house of Israel purifies their heart and returns to Hashem. I was watching a movie uh, the other day, and it was, in, it was in Italian with English subtitles, and it was about a cattle merchant during the Second World War. I'm sorry, uh, yes, he was a, 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 a Italian, and he... Um, was in uh, Romania, I believe, at the time of uh, the Germans invading and w got stuck in the country. And he's trying to rescue about six to 7,000 Jews at the time. And it, he had whisked them away into the Spanish uh, embassy, trying to get them to be saved. And there's one point in the movie in which, I don't know, a couple of thousand people were pulled out of a safe house and were lined up and getting ready to be taken down to the river and shot. And they literally shot these people and they just dumped their bodies in the river. And this, this Jewish man says, please don't shoot my daughter. And so the, the soldier put his pistol up to the guy's forehead. And he says, don't you realize I can crush you? And he says, yes, but don't you realize that we're more refined the, hard, the harder we're crushed? All right? That's the concept. The concept is that as long as we realize that difficulties and struggles are the very thing that brings refinement and purity in our life, we can truly then begin to accept the refinement and the crushing that takes place. The innermost essence, this is, I'm reading this from uh, the Midrash, the innermost essence of uh, a righteous person is, is, it is only his Yetzirah which prevents him or her from serving Hashem. Once the outer husk is removed, by external pressure, the true nature of holiness reasserts itself. Now let's look at some of the neat, natural, uh, interesting uh, properties of, of oil. You can take any type of liquid, liquid pr primarily mixing it together, and what does it do? It just turns into a cohesive unit that you have no way of knowing. Where does the water and the milk separate? Where does my coffee and milk separate? You don't know. Oil doesn't do that. What does oil always do? separates. It rises to the top. So what happens when you do mitzvah, if you are a person who separates yourself unto Hashem with the highest level of mitzvahs, you rise above your culture. You rise above the negativity of physicality. You rise above all of the things that the world is doing, and you therefore float to the top, meaning that you uh, end up getting a higher connection to the creator of the universe than everybody else. That's an, a, a wonderful concept. 
And just as oil serves to illuminate the world, so does the wisdom which radiate through the, 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 uh, the base Hamdash illuminate the entire world. The Kohanim had to refill the lamps of the menorah every evening. The amount of oil necessary for them to burn the oil until the next morning was calculated according to the amount of need through the last, to last through a long winter's night. However, the same amount was used every night, even the shortest number of, uh, in the short summer nights, and as a result, some of the oil would be left over in the summer mornings. And, and then they talk about the special miracle that I had mentioned to you earlier. Let's go to, um, uh, oh, I love this quote. You guys got to hear this. It's really good. Here's a little story. A seeing man and his blind friend once walked a long ways home together. The seeing man said to his friend, let me support you and lead you so that you can arrive home safely. When they arrive at the house, it occurred to the seeing man that his blind friend would certainly be depressed at the thought of his helplessness. He therefore thought of an idea to cheer up his blind friend. Please turn on the light for me, he requested of the blind friend. And actually he did, not, need, not in need of the service, he requested it for the handicapped friend's sake. So in the same reason the why Hashem says light the menorah was it for him, is for you to feel like that you're contributing to bringing illumination in the world. The next text is going to be, that I want to go to, is verse 1 of 28. You should bring your brother Aaron near you with his sons from amongst the Israelites to serve before me, Aaron, Nadav, and Avihu, Eliezer, and Itamar, the sons of Aaron, and make sacred vestments or garments for your brothers Aaron for dignity and beauty. Key words here. Speak with all of the wise-hearted whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom that they should make Aaron's vestments to sanctify him to serve before me. <clears throat> we'll stop there for a second. <clears throat> the... couple of key words. You should bring your brother Aaron near you. Why, this, why the selection of this text? Whenever you see something like this, there's, there's no wasted words, right? We all know that in the Torah. Why didn't you just say, go get Aaron? Why not just go tell Aaron you're going to make clothes? Why the choice of the word near you? Remember where Mos Moses was at this time, especially when he was received Torah. He was high on the mountain. He was face to face with God. He was the only one that spoke to God directly. God spoke to him. The idea is that Aaron's responsibility was now going to shift from being a sidekick of Moshe to being a man who is going to represent the people before the creator of the universe. And it needed to be a man who, when he does this, is going to be um, he's going to be brought up to a whole nother level of dignity and sanctity before the people. Why the idea that he says that you, he, you should take them from among the Israelites, bring them near you. You see something happen here, right? Take them from the Israelites. They all look like you, you stand all the rest of the Israelites next to the You couldn't tell the difference. They all dressed the same. They talked the same. They talked the same language. What was going to differentiate them was going to be their clothing. In a moment, I'm going to talk about how our clothing and how we dress in a postmodern era is very much like the Kohanim. It's going to be very, uh, very uh, hopefully illuminating to you. It says to make special sacred garments. What are these garments? The garments are made up of, of, of um, a shirt or a linen, a long linen shirt that covers from the shoulder all the way down to the ground. And then next are the uh, linen breeches. And then there is the belt, the linen belt that is to go around. Uh, then there is a turban that they wear on their head. That was standard with all the priests to include the high Kohen Gadol. Now the high Kohen Gadol, that is the Hebrew word for high priest, he wore additional uh, vestments on there. And whenever you see it, just let me know. Uh, the, the high Kohen Gadol, there you go, you see, those are the differences between the two right there. Yeah. Right. And I'll, I'll show it on the video in a minute. Um, 
the mantle or the me'il uh, was wore by the high priest. He also wore a, what they call an ephod, and then a, the chosen or the breastplate, and then there is a headplate called a tzitz, which he put on the front, and it and it had the sacred name of God written on it. It's interesting that each one of these pieces of material carried a very special atonement. So whenever the high priest would go into the uh, tabernacle, I mean go into the Holy of Holies, or, or when even when he performed within its regular um, sacrificial system, each one of those items that he wore represented a different atonement for the people. Why was that the case? Is he was representing the people before God. And not only was it important for him to be pure, but it was also he was going before God saying, I carry upon my shoulders, I carry upon my heart the iniquity of the people, and therefore we come to bring sacrifice to you. So let's go through and look at some of these parts of the garment that, um, and what they represent. The first one is the linen. I think there's a picture of the linen shirt and, and all that stuff in the separate items and the breastplate. The, the linen shirt atones for murders that would take place in the nation during that year period that could not be convicted properly because there weren't two witnesses. During, in Torah law, the only way that a person could be convicted of a murder is there had to be two witnesses that that are of upright standing, which meaning having a crackhead and a drug dealer witness against a murderer is not going to work in Torah law. Why? Because you, how do you know what, what they're saying is truthful at all? So it had to be somebody of upstanding um, status, meaning that there would be people who could be murdered that had not been convicted, which is a very terrible thing for society to have um, some unjust injustice happening like this. So if such a murder had been committed in all of Israel, Hashem held the entire people responsible. Do you remember in the Torah law where it says that if a person was found dead in a field near a city? Do you remember this? And if, it, if that person was found dead, then the leaders of the city would be, would be brought out and they are held responsible for the reason why that person's body is still lying there. And what they would do is take and make that part of the field sacred and they would bury him, and you couldn't do anything on that city, in that part of the city. So the idea, or the part of the town, so the idea is you take responsibility for what is happening in the community around you. Um, and uh, also, it, 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 it atones for guilt. It, it was chosen for this specific sin since it states that his brothers, Joseph's brothers, uh, dipped his shirt in blood. So the idea is not only is it murder, but it's the idea that he wears the white linen and there's no blood on it. You understand? It's like that guilt has been removed from it. Next is um, the breeches, the linen breeches. Did you ever find it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's not a big picture, but there's the linen breeches. Yeah, here's the linen breeches and there's the tunic, yeah, the tunic right, there. right there and there's the turban. Um, the... Um, the linen breeches, let's look at that. It atones for immorality. Where does most immorality take place? In the breeches. Okay, pretty simple. We don't have to talk about that too much, right? Uh, next is the migba'as, um, the turban. The turban atones for arrogance. Where does arrogance take place? In the mind. Also, it's about lifting my head above Hashem. You remember when it says, and, and Israel lift up its head when someone was leaving Egypt? Its head was lifted up. It's like, hey, yeah, you're not going to get me down. Yeah, there you go. One was pointed in the high priest. Haikon Gadol was, uh, uh, was a little bit more f uh, flat. Um, the, uh, the avnait, or the belt, which was a linen belt, was worn over the heart and therefore atoned for improper thoughts of the heart. It was 32 amos long, equivalent to the numerical number in the gematria of Lamed Bet, heart, which means, uh, which is 32. The chosen is the breastplate that the high priest wore, atoned for the sin of perverted judgment. 
since it was worn over the Kohen, uh, Kohenin's, uh, High Kohen Kadol's heart, false judgment emanates from improper thoughts of the heart. So it went in to, to, um, to atone for negative thought. The, uh, the ephod, it is for the transgression of idol worship. The idol worshipers generally would use an ephod in their religious worship. So, in this ephod, what was different is the tribe's names were attached to that ephod. And so, they are going before the Creator of the universe. They're going before Hashem. Aaron is going before Hashem. He's taking them in with him and saying, Our allegiance now is to you, O God. They are ascribed on the heart of God. They recognize their place in the world, and they ask for you to atone for them. The uh, me'il, um, which the me'il is the mantle, is for speaking lashon hara, or speaking evil against another person. And uh, the tzitz, which is worn, the gold band on the front of the forehead, was to atone for chutzpah, or brazenness. And it basically it uh, says that a guy with a tremendous amount of uh, brazenness it says, he forehead of uh, La Shinzona. So the idea is that someone is, is very brazen, very bold. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the golden plate with the sacred name of God on the front of it. Uh, yes, very good. Um, okay, let me close with these, with these thoughts. Our clothes reflects both our personalities and desires. I want you to think about this for a second. Our clothes represents our personalities and desires. My dad used to say, as a blessed memory, uh, he bought me this book when I was about 12, and it was called Dress for Success. Do you guys remember anything like that? I don't even know who put that out. Then there was a lot of self-help books about that. But he always said, uh, dress like you want to be, not what you are. Right? Dress like you want to be. Uh, so, you know, I remember I didn't want to do it, but I remember when I had my first job at Sears. My dad made me wear a tie. I was like 16 or 17. And I was like, I don't want to wear a tie. I look like a dork. Right? Because that was, you know, at the time people, that was, everybody's was really loose and chilled out. And I had to wear dress slacks and a tie. And I knew I felt like a real nerd. But it helped me on my job because they thought I took my job seriously. One who dresses in a dignified manner and according to the standards of modesty shows that he or she wants to be close to a chef. Period. Now it's not that we're doing this because we're trying to bring attention to ourselves. We're trying to say that if you're going to look at me, you're going to see the dignity and the splendor of God. The clothes that the High Kohen Gadol wore was not worn in such a way that everybody said, wow, that brother has some bling. It wasn't about him looking good. It wasn't about them thinking, wow, I want to look like the high priest. No, when they saw him, they would say, oh, the splendor of Hashem. The Creator is so marvelous. His people are so wonderful. That's what they would say. When someone looks at you and I, do they see someone who should be in the photo album of those people that go to Walmart pictures? <laughs> or do they see you as a potential individual who has splendor of God all over them? Now look, I'm going to have to be honest with you. 15, 20 years ago, I had no reservations about going to public places, basically looking like I just came out back from the beach, right? No reservation at all because modesty was not, that level of modesty was not, now I wouldn't dress indecent, but that for sure to my standards today is, was, is in a modest. Now I don't do it. It's not because I'm 53 and I should be totally covered, okay? Because that's the fact. 
But the point, point would be, if I knew what I knew now, I would have most definitely not dressed that way. Because it doesn't reflect well on my master. That's what this is about. I want people to look and say, I want them to look at me and go, this is a guy who must have a very special connection with, with God. That's what I want. And I hope that that's what you want as well. And it doesn't mean that you have to wear a, dre, a, a, a fur hat, a, a, a black a long coat and a white shirt. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is looking acceptable and modest in your lifestyle. And, and we're not trying to look like everybody else in the world. That's just it. We're not trying to do that. And it's a little bit easier for us guys now who wear beards because that's sort of the end thing. But when I started wearing a beard, it wasn't the end thing. And I remember people telling me, I don't like it. And I said, well, I didn't grow this for you. Right? That was my comeback. Hashem commands that we should be, and the Jewish people, a, a nation of priests, a holy nation. As such modest, dignified clothes are the priestly garb of today. So are those people who are within the nations who attach themselves to Torah and attach themselves to the Jewish people. Though you may be B'nai Noach, there is a standard of modesty because you are now also representing what is Jewish and wisdom. Does that make sense? I think I mentioned to you this the other day, but it's a good illustration. I had someone ask me about whether it was appropriate for them to go to a beach. And I said, look, you know, you're at a place right now, you're in a transition of your life. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's a sin for you to go to a beach. This was not a Jewish person. It was not a person that knows a whole lot. But they're still very much well on their way. So what you should ask yourself is this. Do you represent the creator of the universe best at a beach or at a place that's modest? That's simple. Very simple to say. And each person has to figure out where they belong in that. King Nebuchadnezzar knew the merit of Jewish youth. He said that after he destroyed the first holy temple and subjugated the Jewish people and Jerusalem and Judea and exiled the Jews to Babylon, he ordered his chief officer to find noble youths of the Ju Judea that were unblemished, good-looking, skillful in all wisdom, discerning and knowledgeable, and capable of serving the king's palace. He wanted young Jewish men that were capable of serving the palace. What does that mean? You're not going to be, what's, I'm trying to think of some country terms, bootleg. You're not going to be messed up and serve in the king's palace. You're not going to be uh, vulgar and serve in the king's palace. Toe up, yeah. He's, he's, uh, I don't even know if anybody knows what that is anymore. <laughs> Toe up from the flow up. I used to say that all the time. My, and what, what I feel sorry for is those people who are going to be listening to this from another language is their first language, and they will have no clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> I apologize. Um, the three young men that were taken, he ended up changing their names to uh, Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king did everything in his power to assimilate them, right? What they eat, how they dress, how they look. He changed their names. He tried to get them to change their diets. He even named them based on Babylonian deities. Yet these external changes had no influence on the steadfast inner faith and dedication to Hashem that permitted every fiber of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to uh, elevate their soul. They remained true to their Muna upbringing despite the enormous social pressure around them. They didn't assimilate or compromise their pr principles in the slightest. What we need in this generation is a generation of righteous people, whether Jew or non-Jew, it doesn't matter, to take a hold of Hashem and cling to Him and say no longer are we going to try to be like the rest of the world. We want to be like representatives of the creator of the universe, a representative of dignity and splendor and of holiness and purity and godliness. And that is our mission on this earth. That concludes this sure, and we'll have questions and answers.